December and welcome to a new month of the cross-border interviews, where we sit down with local elected leaders from across Canada. Throughout this episode, we will be learning about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place. Now, in today's episode, we are honored to be sitting down with the village of Sterling, Alberta's mayor, Trevor Lewington. But before we dive into our interview with the mayor, I have a small request for those tuning in and watching this episode right now. Our other show, The Political Trenches Local Government at Work, is looking for the top municipal news from across Canada of 2023. We are looking for the biggest political moves, the biggest municipal shakeups, or even the biggest municipal fumbles of 2023. Now, if you have a story in mind that you believe was the biggest news story municipally across Canada, message us today. We want to see what you were reading and watching this year. Either visit crossborderinterviews.ca and click on the Political Trenches tab or message us directly with your news story. Now on to our interview with Mayor Lewington. Trevor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start with a question that I've started all my interviews off with, and you're no exception to that question, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Trevor? Great question. You know, I think everyone needs to understand their motivations for wanting to engage in public service. I think there's many councils that are examples of when people go for the wrong reasons or they become a one issue candidate and maybe don't understand the scope of their powers and what what the job actually requires. So uh, for me, it was about being worried about the future of our community. So Sterling is a you know relatively small community, bedroom community of Lethbridge. And at the time, this was 10 years ago, I was concerned about, uh, you know, a lack of strategic direction and a lack of sort of, I didn't have a sense that there was a game plan long term. And that's not to be pejorative to the previous councils. You know, most people that serve should be thanked. Um, and particularly in small towns where you're effectively volunteering your time. But for me, it was, you know, I thought, you know, my background in industry, my sort of, I had some thoughts that I had around the future of the community. And so if I could somehow make a difference, as, as cliche as that sounds, if I could make a difference and somehow get involved, then, you know, perhaps I could bring my skills to bear. So I started attending some council meetings. I started taking notes. I started going to a few public hearings and ultimately made the decision that I needed to run and, and sort of be a part of what I, you know, hopefully could be part of the change. And here I am on my third term now, you know, almost 10 years into this process. So I guess, I guess it was the right decision. Before we get into your time in office, I've got to ask the sort of the typical follow-up question to the duty to serve, but were you a political family growing up? Did you follow politics? Were you involved municipally or was it something that came later in life? No, I, I have a really unique experience um, when in high school. My first job ever, I applied to be a page in the provincial legislature. So right, right from grade 10 onwards, I was in the thick of it. I served a total of six years with the Legislative Assembly Office. I was, I was a page, I was a tour guide, I worked for Hansard, which is the official record. I worked in the Assembly's HR office, I worked in the Speaker's office. So I think right from the very beginning, I had this curiosity about how politics works. And for me, it was the big discrepancy between what you went home and saw on the TV that night when you had just been sitting in the chamber. And you're like, well, I, I don't remember that conversation. Well, I don't remember that soundbite. And so for me, it became this fast, it was fascinating to me how politics and process is perceived versus how it actually works. So I would say, you know, ever since that experience, that was pretty formative to me, uh, got me curious about how governments function. And, you know, even I'm a total nerd when it comes to parliamentary procedure, as an example. This idea that most of Canada's constitution isn't actually even written down. It comes from parliamentary traditions that are sometimes 600 years old. So people, you say, oh, well, the constitution says, it's like, well, it has about 17 parts. So which one are you referencing, right? And I don't think most people take the time to really understand the Canadian context. They're too used to watching American TV and kind of that. There's this amendment and that amendment, which course is completely irrelevant here so yeah long story short started in high school it's been a part of been, been in my blood i think ever since that sort of those formative years if you will 
So, so it begs the question, why go municipal? Because you have an extensive career sort of seeing the sausage being made in the provincial legislature. You think you'd want to go into the political realm in the provincial mandate, but you chose in 2013 municipal. Was it just to give back to your community or was there another reason that new family? What was the major driving force about giving back and choosing the municipal route? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, to be candid, the provincial route would have been a pay cut from my job in industry. It would have been a very much a change in life. Still had a younger family, certainly two kids at home that you're you're being mindful of. And I look at sort of the the scrutiny and the the sort of exposure that provincial and federal politicians, which is very different than at the municipal level. I just wasn't interested in sort of opening myself up to that. And it's not that I have anything to hide, at least I don't think so. It was more just the, it, particularly now, especially in the social media age, every comment, every speech, everything is, is, is scrutinized to such an extent that, in my opinion, it precludes honest debate and it, it precludes a, a sort of a fair exchange of ideas. And municipal to me was just way more hands-on, way more practical and tangible. So, I mean, never say never. I have no intention of running for any other political office, but I think you know, in a perfect world, everyone would be rooted in some experience at the municipal level because when party politics aren't a part of it, you really are focused on solutions and working with your council. And that to me is that's the fun part. You've been there for 10 years, four years as a councillor, and now six years as mayor of the village of right. Sterling, being elected in 20, so well, being appointed, I apologize, in 2017 to the position of mayor because your council is elected as large as councillors, and then within the council, you appoint. Um, right. I, I've got to ask a question that I've asked a lot of municipal councillors. And since you've had a sort of a tenure uh, as a municipal politician, has the role of municipal governance and municipal politics changed since 2013 when you first got elected to now? Are you dealing with the same issues or are you dealing with a more diverse range of issues that you weren't dealing with in 2013 compared to today? I certainly think it's different. Uh, certainly social issues are more prominent than they've ever been. And I, you know, I would argue that the, the COVID and the pandemic accelerated that trend and probably exacerbated it to an extent that we might not be in the same spot today had that not happened. But you know, it's it's a combination of things. So, you know, the province has effectively been downloading both cost and execution of programs to municipalities. That's fact. And so that means, you know, somebody has to step up. And when you're the frontline level of government, you're closest to the source. That typically means it rolls, you know, stuff rolls downhill, as they say. Um, and, and I think it's it, it, that's actually a good thing. Municipalities are actually better suited They're there. We are boots on the ground. So when there's a housing issue, we certainly look for provincial support on the capital. But I can probably find a better location, a better design and a better operator than a bureaucrat respectfully you know in a, in a building multiple hundreds of kilometers away when it comes to working with you know fcss or family and community social support services who are very involved in our community they're a great organization across the whole region you know their staff are in our community they're much we're much, you know i think we can have a, a real dialogue on here's here's the things we'd like to see here's how that goes so it's not necessarily a bad thing that the issues are more more frontline, more social focus. I think municipalities are better suited to solve some of those things, uh, but it just it does add to the workload, right? So historically, municipalities were make sure the road gets shoveled, make sure the make sure the garbage gets picked up, and if you got to build a new subdivision, make sure the sewers in the ground. And I think, you know, ten years ago, that was very much the focus of our conversations: capital planning, some community events. But now you're concerned about homelessness, and you're concerned about you know, family violence, and you're concerned about whether or not the programs at the school are addressing the needs. And that's, I think that's relatively new in municipal governance, and certainly an increasing scope. Sterling's fortunate, we're very small, by comparison, you know, 1300 people, as compared to some of the larger urban areas. But I think those issues are common everywhere. You bring up a good point, and you mentioned the word downloading, and I uh, often talk about downloading, but I talk about apathy as well, and misunderstanding as well. Um, we are it, it, across Canada, and I, I say this as Chris Brown, the host of the show, not the mayor of Sterling, but Chris Brown, the host, that I believe there's a big misunderstanding from the general public about the jurisdictional roles that 
the municipality plays compared to the provincial and mm -hmm. the federal government. You're right. You are the closest to the people. You go to the corner store, people are going to see you and know who you are. You make a decision, they know where to find you. You're not in Edmonton, right. you're not in Ottawa doing your job, you're in your community. In the village of Sterling, do you see a misunderstanding or are people informed enough that they're approaching you on municipal issues, their MLA at, on provincial issues, and their federal government MP on federal issues? Or are they just coming to you because you are the closest to them and they see you as that conduit to talk to the MLA or talk to the MP? I think it's a spectrum, right? So there are certainly people that are well informed and understand the, the different roles of levels of government. And so they, you know, they seek out the, the appropriate authority. Sometimes people have absolutely no idea who's responsible for what. And so to your point, you're at the post office at the same time you they are. So there's the, there's that direct dialogue. But I do think, you know, as as much as those roles are clear, they're also not clear and they've they've blended a lot. So, you know, we like to say things like healthcare is provincial jurisdiction. But it relies heavily on federal funding and there's often restrictions and there's now federal supplemental programs that are delivered directly by municipalities. And then municipalities have taken on things like emergency first response, which should be EMS and belong to the province, but it's municipal jurisdiction. So to me, it's no wonder that people are confused because I'm sometimes confused when when we have these overlaps. Right. And if we if we just look at the healthcare component. You know, for pre pre reorganization of AHS, it was still confusing because my volunteer firefighters are providing a medical first response. It's not a provincially funded EMS person that's the first person that 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 the victim sees, right? And so they're rightly confused when they don't understand why I can't help speed up that ambulance because it's our firefighters in our in our logo truck that shows up to help them first. Like, well, what are you doing about that? Well, you need to talk to your MLA. So. I think the, in a way, things have shifted in the last number of years where it is naturally confusing to people. So I don't blame folks that they don't necessarily understand. But yeah, it's a it's a constant education process. Of, and I've seen some municipalities have some great infographics that you know delineate on a chart. Here's the three columns of who does what. But even that doesn't always work because it's not clear. It isn't. And I want to turn to the, because I'm cautious of time and I want to make sure I get in as, enough, as much as possible as I can into this interview, because I think it's going to be fascinating when we turn to the village, because I want to ask some very important questions. Um, but I want to talk about the role of council for a second, because over the last few years, you've had to make some pretty tough choices as a local elected official. You talk about those downloading issues. We talk about COVID-19. Municipalities were the front line and you were impacting your residents and particularly and even the budget this year is probably going to be hard for municipalities. Right. Now, I can imagine you want the best for everyone, but you understand that the village needs to grow, services need to continue to grow, inflation is something that is on everyone's mind, and you have to raise potential taxes or cut services. How do you see your role in ensuring that the growth of the community still happens, but it doesn't happen on the backs of the residents who are struggling, who are paycheck to paycheck, who are looking at paying their uh, hydro bill compared to buying groceries that week? Yeah, I mean, that that is a regular debate um, at our table. Um, for me, you know, back all the way to the beginning, I've been very fortunate to be a part of three councils, all very different. But each one, we spent a lot of time right up front at the beginning of our term to really talk about what was important to us, but also what's the vision for the community, right? So every single council has talked about sustainable growth, meaning that we want to make sure that we can grow because we need to grow to survive. But that, to your point, it's not done on the backs of people. And so that's been a very conscious, deliberate point that's that's a part of every conversation that we have. And I think we've been pretty realistic. So every council that I've been a part of has had a, a very detailed four-year strategic plan or business plan. But we've been very conscious about what we can realistically do. Of course, you want to be aspirational. You want to have stretch goals. You want to have that forward-thinking vision. But, but there's only so much shiny stuff you can build because frankly, we just don't have the resources, right? So I think having those very candid conversations around the council table really set the tone, but also knowing where you're going, having a roadmap and having a clear picture of what's in or out of scope and you know, short, medium and long-term. 
And every time we make a decision, we're very conscious, particularly in Sterling, our tax base is mostly residential. About, you know, just under 98% of it, of, of our tax revenues come from residential as opposed to non-residential or industrial taxpayers. So every spending increase we consider has a direct impact on people's property taxes. There's a there's a direct and tangible link, and they are not afraid to let you know when they re when they come to that realization after you approve your budget either, right? So I think we have to remember, our, and it's it sometimes governments forget, this is not our money. Governments have no money. All of this money is money I'm taking out of your pocket as a resident. So I need to be able to explain to you in great detail why I'm making the decisions I'm making and where those dollars are going. And for us, our focus has been largely around core infrastructure, making sure that we have sustainability in water and sewer and that there's no surprises down the road. And that means saying no to people. You know, we're, we're, we're okay with the pool in its current size. We're not going to expand it. We're, we're not going to go and build an arena, even if we get that grant, because the operating expense down the road is just not something we can afford. And so it's, to me, it's really about having some of those tough conversations to help people understand the trade-offs and help them realize why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, and hopefully, you know, having dialogue about, you know, coming to those things. And, you know, just a small example, we have a community festival every July. Uh, you know, it's, there's, there's always been a number of components of that. A couple of years ago, I was like, you know, we can't afford the family dance. We'd shut down a street, have a DJ. We're not going to do that this year. We're going to focus on some of the other elements of that festival. Well, I heard about that very quickly. And my conversation <laughs> with the individual was, look, there's there's no money. If you, if you want us to do that, go find me a sponsor. And they were like, okay. So not only did they go find a sponsor, they organized that particular part of the event. They set it all up. They, they helped promote it. And they went and found the DJ and, and, and made that happen. So sometimes those kind of conversations allow other people to step up or other sources to come forward as well. So it doesn't sound like there's an apathy in Sterling, is there? When it comes well, to actually I, I people think... getting involved or even giving their opinions on some of the decisions that council has probably made over the last 10 years, you probably have heard from your residents. Yeah, I, I mean, I think like any community, there's probably a third of people at any given time that aren't even aware there's a municipal government and probably pay no attention whatsoever until tax notices come out. Then there's probably a third in the middle that are engaged when it affects them directly. And I think there's then there's that third and maybe smaller, depending on the community of, you know, very involved, very engaged, very vocal. And so certainly we have a broad spectrum, but I, you know, I do feel like we get a high level involvement in our volunteer committees. We have a number of committees that do community event planning, as an example. Uh, that's, that's all of our events are driven by volunteers, uh, which is very powerful. We have a volunteer fire department that's abnormally large for a community our size. But again, I think it speaks to that engagement. But apathy in politics, I think, is universal these days. <laughs> um, and so there's, there's going to be pockets of that no matter where you are. I don't think we're special, uh, but it's, you know, maybe you can't hide in Sterling or if you want to see things happen, we're relying on those people to step forward. And so they know that. And so that's just a natural part of the process. I, I, we often say that the municipality is the closest to the people. I, I, I'm assuming right. if you go to the local uh, park or go to an event, people know you are the mayor of their community. They may not know exactly who their MLA is there. They may not know who the MP is. And that means that potentially if you make a decision at council, they are going to know about it the day after they make it. And you have to give people the respect that they have concerns. They're going to bring it up to you about the votes that you have made at council. How important is it for you as mayor of a community like Sterling to ensure that you're listening to everyone, not just the people who potentially have voted for you? I know the last council was all acclaimed, but even in 2017 and 2013, to listen to everyone and not just the people in your echo chamber and ensure right. that all voices are being heard by you and even the ones who disagree with you. Yeah, I think that's the key challenge at any level of government, but more so at the municipal level is is trying to get that engagement, cut through some of the apathy to engage people in conversation. I mean, good or bad, we have two very active Facebook groups uh, that are populated by community members. And so that is often the place where these debates play out. I'm not a huge fan of that platform some of the time, but candidly, it allows me to catch up on 
50 or 60 comments on a post around an issue, it would be very tough for me to have those conversations in the street effectively. So social media can be helpful there. I write how, a monthly newsletter. How much is it that they want to actually just hear, have someone listen to them? Because people get frustrated at politicians a lot sure. these days, and you're probably seeing it more than anyone. And I can imagine that when you talk to people, they just want to be listened to and hear their concerns being vented because they don't feel like they're being heard at other levels of government. Are you finding that in your community, that they just want to be I, heard? I, yeah, it's, it's a bit of that. It's also the fact that they also just want the information, right? So, you know, council minutes, as you know, are very fact-based, very non explicit the, the law actually precludes us from adding comments and notes, which I would love to do. It just literally, here's the decision. And yet you might have spent an hour talking about that motion and you can't, how do you articulate that hour of debate and educate people? So, Part, it's a two-way street. I love hearing the feedback. I want to hear suggestions. I want to hear comments from people. But I also want to be able to impart that information in terms of here's the backstory. Here's why we made the decision. And typically, if you can explain the rationale, if you can walk people through the facts and figures, I mean, our business plans on the website, our infrastructure master plans on the website, I can point people to those resources. I'm, and I, you know, I've, sat, I've sat down with people and walked them through the budget. I'd be like, all right, you show me where you would cut. Like, here's a pen. You tell me what you want to cross off. That that can be very powerful because like, whoa, I, there's really nothing that I see as something that I would give up. But good. I agree. That's that's where we're at, right? But yeah, the more we can give people a voice and the more we can get people engaged in the decisions that affect their life. And here's my classic example. And I've used this many times in Sterling and I've talked about this many times. But to me, it's the epitome of where we're at as a society. You know, we're changing the land use bylaw. This determines how you can use your own private property. Probably in the last couple of times, no one showed up. No one has any interest. Okay. Then we pass a budget and change property tax bylaws. Again, no one's in the gallery. No one asks questions. I'm literally taking money out of your wallet. Nobody cares. When was the council chamber completely full and overwhelmed? The cat bylaw. <clears throat> That's when the wheels came off the bus because we were talking about changes to how we license and how we control cats. Oh, okay, then. Well, you know, again, that's a reflection of sometimes where people's focus is. And we, again, I think education is part of it, engaging people is part of it, uh, and, and, and hearing those voices. <laughs> Um, I, I'm cautious of time and I want to turn to my second segment and I want to talk about the village of Sterling as a whole right now. But before right. I do, I always preface this question by saying this. this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a policy of council. This is not a direction of council. This is the mayor's opinion. I don't know why, but we still get emails about this on a regular basis. So hopefully people in Sterling understand what I just said. <laughs> if they're listening to this, and I, I apologize. I am but one vote out of five. <laughs> So any decision that gets made requires at least at least three people to make a decision. It's a good so point. with both of that being said, I want to ask the sort of uh, question, and that is, in your opinion, as of recording this episode, what do you believe is the biggest issue or issues facing the village of Sterling today? Yeah, it's not sexy, but for me, it's about infrastructure, right? So we have aging infrastructure like most communities. We have depleting sources of revenue from the province. And so for the longevity of our community, it's about upgrading sewer lines and potable water lines and making sure pumps and valves are in place. And that that's not exciting, that, that there's no ribbon cutting, there's no ceremony there. And most people don't even think about the infrastructure that they can't see under the ground. But unless we get that under control, that's a huge potential risk down the road to our community. So that certainly is top of mind all the time. Uh, the second one for us is, again, around that growth piece. So uh, Sterling grew 19% between the last two census periods. So we were the fastest growing municipality in our region, which that's good news. You know, we're, as one of my council colleagues likes to say, our unofficial slogan is 20 minutes to Costco. You know, we're we're more of a bedroom community that, to Lethbridge than some neighborhoods in Lethbridge are, and that we can get some of those services before they can. But that that's a challenge in that, you know, half of our community commutes for work. And that means they're buying groceries and buying things in Lethbridge rather than our community. So how do we how do we grow the residential? How do we grow services that are available uh, when you know the funds are limited for those kinds of developments? So really keying in on what attracts people, what's going to keep them in our community. How do we 
how do we be that sustainable community from a growth perspective? That 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 and infrastructure, those are the two things that keep me up at night. So this seems to be a reoccurring theme across Alberta, but also across Canada right now. And I always ask this question when I hear those two side by side. Infrastructure before growth or growth before infrastructure. It's the chicken or the egg scenario that you've been put into here because you understand that growth needs to happen. It's happening. People are coming to your community, as you've just outlined. And that means that yep. you have to increase infrastructure spending. But some developers will not want to come and build housing in your community if there's no infrastructure already in place. So how do you balance that aspect of growth when you understand that you need to start the process of building these infrastructures, increasing wastewater, sewage treatment facilities to ensure that if developers do come knocking on your door, the village is set up to allow that growth, which will potentially offset some tax base later down the line. Yeah, I think that is one of the key challenges for any community to think about is timing and how do you phase those things. So for us, it's first of all, understanding the deficits. So again, we did an infrastructure master plan to understand where all the gremlins are buried and where the potential problems might be. So we understand that we have a map, we have priorities. Uh, we think we have a plan in terms of how we can execute that. We've also identified the areas where we think we're gonna see growth and we're targeting in a perfect world, if you're addressing an existing infrastructure deficiency, if you can also, rather than just replace, but upgrade at the same time to add capacity that, you know, you can try and be proactive at the same time. You know, the funding growth while fixing issues can be done in parallel somewhat. So to me, it's it's about doing the engineering, having a solid understanding of what's actually required and then prioritizing. So we can't do it all. We, we have to kind of decide how much of the elephant we're going to eat and in what order. And it, as long as you have a plan, even if it takes 20 years, I think, you know, you can sequence that accordingly, right? The last two years, we've seen the inflation across this country rise. We've seen the affordability crisis deepen a lot. Yeah. And this means that that elephant that you talk about is no longer an elephant. It's maybe a hippo. So it's a lot smaller than the elephant. So you have to make some very tough decisions, particularly when it comes to infrastructure, because costs are ballooning and municipalities do not have an unlimited supply of money while your debt ratio is quite quite good compared to other municipalities that I've seen. How do you see yourself in ensuring that the projects continue to go forward, but you understand that you're going to have to cancel some or potentially postpone a few of these infrastructure upgrades and growth upgrades to 10, even five years down the line? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the cost environment right now is terrifying. So, for example, PVC pipe and some of the other materials that we use for these projects went up 30, 40, 50 percent with really no reason. But how do you absorb a 50 percent cost increase in a project? You, you simply don't have those extra dollars. So it's a very real problem. For me, it comes down to innovation. So, again, we're blessed with a very creative administrative team. They've come up with some very interesting solutions uh, on in terms of controlling costs on programs. and frankly challenging the engineers sometimes on, can we do this a different way? And, and so my example would be at our pool, we were looking to replace a boiler and a standard boiler of that sort of age and size, we'd need about $100,000. And you know we asked the question, and so now we've got three mini boilers, which fire in sequence instead of all together. So there's an efficiency play. And we were able to secure federal funding that puts solar preheat on the roof of the pool that further reduces this, the size and scope of those boilers. So rather than just replace our boiler with another big boiler, we found new technology, a combination of technologies. We changed some of the piping and, and infrastructure of the pool and actually delivered a much cheaper solution that I think longer term is a much better option. But it, that was extra work and that required lots of different heads around the table to be like, okay, how can we do this differently? And that, that I think is the key, is how do we think through these things differently? take different approaches, take examples from other industries, for example, and maybe not do what we've always done and just add that new cost. I think we, we really have to challenge convention. 
you've talked about two very big macro issues, infrastructure and growth. But if I go talk to a hundred people in Sterling, I guarantee you they're going to probably talk about a few macro issues, but they're going to talk about a lot of micro issues, that pothole in front of my house, that park that needs to be upgraded. How do you balance and how does your council as a whole balance the needs of the individual with the needs of the community? Because you want to make sure that everyone feels like they're getting the best bang for their buck when they're paying their taxes, that they're feeling that their voices are being heard and their issues are being addressed. But you know, and you said it a little bit earlier, that sometimes you do have to say no to people. And that is probably the worst thing as a politician you could ever say to uh, a resident who potentially has your vote and your job four years down the line. So how do you balance the needs of the community with the needs of the individual? So to all of the residents of Sterling that may tune into this broadcast, I do want to say that we do actively consider that trade-off. We're very conscious of the pain that we create when we do say no. Uh, but it, but again, I think to your point, it, it's helping people understand, right? So here's the trade-off we made. Here's why we made that. And, and even though not everyone's going to agree or they're going to think that their pothole should be on the top of the list, I hope that in providing the justification or the explanation, people are at least able to respect this decision, even if they don't agree with it. So again, I think the education and communication part is very, very important. Uh, and, you know, and, and I don't think you can ever over communicate. We've seen that in all areas of life. I, I think more information, the better. Um, and again, it's inviting people to, to come up with solutions. So if someone has a, an idea for a project, it's like, okay, great. Here's how much we could contribute to that. Or here's some of the grant programs that are out there for that. What else can you do? What else do you suggest? How do we, how do we get people involved in finding those solutions? Because it is, it is not fun to your point to say no, uh, but it, it, it is a necessity because there at the end of the day, there are only so many dollars to go around. And that's, and that's even life safety. Like, you know, I, I hate, I, and I say this respectfully, I hate every time the fire department comes to visit because they're asking for stuff, right? They need, they need equipment, they need training. And, and, and ultimately it's hard to argue with that because they're making life and death decisions quite literally in our service area and how they provide those resources. But I simply can't give them everything that's on their wish list. So you know, is there fundraising? Is there alternatives? Can we work with other departments? So they're like, we just have to go back to the well and find other ways to get it done. Now, I've been accused on this show, actually, from a, a counselor in Alberta from Brazo County. I keep on throwing her under the bus because she's the one who pointed this out to me, that I only talk about the negatives about communities when we talk about the community aspect of the show. Um, so I'm going to sort of flip the question that I originally asked and say, what does Sterling get right? When you go to Alberta municipalities, when you go to talk to other municipal leaders from across Alberta or even across Canada, and they say, we're doing it great. You say, well, no, you're doing it okay. Sterling's doing it better. What's the thing that you boast about to your fellow municipal colleagues across Alberta that El Sterling is doing right? Uh, so two things. The first one, very specifically, is our move towards net zero electrically. So we have ground mount and rooftop solar arrays that have lowered our electrical bills. And to be clear, it was not a sustainability initiative. There are benefits to the environment. There are benefits from a greenhouse gas reduction, but we took what was a cost. We used to have to pay to power streetlights and municipal buildings that now generates revenue for us. So eliminating that cost, particularly over the last couple of years when um, there's been some inflation on electrical pricing in case you hadn't noticed on your bill, Oh, uh, oh I, I've noticed. I've noticed, Trevor. <laughs> okay. So that wasn't a surprise. Good. I didn't want to burst your bubble. Um, but, you know, that that was a very significant strategic move that helped us avoid a very, a very tough economic pressure that hasn't been an issue for us. And so, to me, doing that shows that it's possible in a smaller community that you can do these creative and innovative projects, but you can also deliver productivity and change change the map, right? Just because you have a power bill doesn't mean you have to accept it. So what else can you change in the same way? The second thing I would say Sterling does quite well is just the level of community caring for each other. So, you know, there there's a, a number of supports through, through um, religious organizations in the community. There's a high level of engagement in organizations like FCSS, but I, you know, there 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 is a real sense of community and even people that moved to Sterling that have none of the history and, you know, just came here because the, the house was cheaper than anywhere else they looked.
they describe it as being different. And of course, every small town mayor is going to say that. Um, but there really is this sense of community. And, you know, when we have a community event, for example, during our summer festival, we have beef on a bun. There were like 600 people there. Half the town was there for the community event. Like there's there's a high level of presence. Um, and that to me says we're doing something right as a, and that's got nothing to do with me, frankly. That's just the community itself. There is that shared values, shared vision. There is that cohesive component, which I think people are hungry for. People are looking for that. You, you talk about the net zero, and I just have a question to follow up on that statement here, because uh, that is a big project that you guys, that the village set out to accomplish to get net zero. And I can imagine in Alberta, there's probably some pushback that they would say, well, government doesn't need to be in the uh, role of producing net zero or even being in the electrical business as well why did you do it? And I've got to ask that sort of simple question, but why was it important for the village of uh, Sterling to get this done? Yes, cost is one thing, but costs change all the time for other different aspects of the municipal right. realm as well. Why was it important for net zero to be the top priority for your council? Uh, you know, back in 2017, when we were first exploring the issues, we were looking at the forward-looking forecast and at that moment in time, we were paying around five cents per kilowatt hour, thinking that was a complete ridiculous ripoff. <laughs> and the forward-looking, the forward-looking curve said, "Hey, you're going to be paying fifteen to twenty cents," which at the time was unfathomable to us. But our costs were literally going to quadruple by around 2022, 2023, which turned to be somewhat prescient because here we are. And so we said there is. There is just no way we can afford to quadruple our power bill as a community. What can we do about that? And, you know, we had some information come to us around solar. We did some more research. It was, it was the reason it became a priority is because it, it, just from a math perspective, it was a no brainer. We were like, this just makes sense. And it eliminates this as a future threat on the cost scale. Let's cross that one off and move on to the next thing. So for us, you know, a function of grants that were available at the time, the resources we had, it just made inherent good sense. It was a math problem and we had a solution and there was a payback and it was like, okay, let's go do next. I appreciate your candor there. And I want to turn to my last segment because I'm cautious of time. And it's a segment yeah. that I enjoy and that is tourism. I think municipalities uh, play a big role in tourism, but I don't think municipalities boast themselves enough to say, come to our community because there's some hidden gems in our community. If I potentially was going to be coming to the village of Sterling, as I've promised everyone who's ever come on this show, I will be in your community. Hypothetically, if I'm there in potentially December or even January, what are some of the hidden gems that I should be checking out in Sterling or even in the area of Sterling? So in, in the community itself, we have an amazing bed and breakfast. The Country Bar and B&B is literally an old barn that used to have horses and livestock in it that was converted by hand. To this amazing bed and breakfast with multiple rooms it's just an amazing gorgeous property and uh, tom uh, the gentleman that converted it with his wife they operate b and b so they've got lots of stories about the construction uh, sterling is a national historic site so we're one of only three nationally uh, because of how the built the village was designed and laid out so i think that's interesting but the challenge with tourism is you know many small communities have a thing and maybe a museum, or they might have a, an Airbnb or something. But how do you fill multiple days? How do you fill people's time, right? So for us, it is all about the region. Certainly in the village, we have what's called the Mickelson Farmstead. It's a provincial historic resource. It's a it's a great example of you know early 1900s farmhouse and how and we've kept all kinds of artifacts. Just outside the village in the county of Warner is the Galt Railway Museum. So Galt Park has restored uh, what was the original Coots uh, rail station right on the border, and they've restored a number of trains. Great property. Uh, they're they're open most of the summer as well. And, you know, thankfully, we're in this region where there's four UNESCO World Heritage Sites around us. So within about 90 minutes of Sterling, you've got Waterton Park, you know, the International Peace Park with Glacier. You've got Head Smashed in Buffalo Jump. You've got uh, Writing on Stone Provincial Park. So there's all of these great places, we'd love to host you in Sterling. And I, I I heard you commit publicly out loud that you're coming to visit us, what I heard. So I'll be happy to host you and provide you with a tour uh, when you come down. 
But you know, I, again, I'm certainly going to be there. I, I promise that to everyone. And trust me, that has uh, kind of bit me in the butt from time to time. But I plan to get up to the Yukon and plan to get up to Inuvik, uh, Northwest Territories. So Sterling's a hop, skip and jump from Calgary. <laughs> perfect. Easy, right? You know, I, I think the secret sauce for smaller communities is to recognize that they probably have little developed product to actually showcase. So you need to work on that. You need to have something to show. But then how do you work with neighboring towns that are 5, 10, 15 minutes away? And maybe you put together packages or you put together events, right? So the town of Raymond is 10 minutes away from us. They do a marvelous job of different events. And so we've worked with them in the past on combining forces. We've co-promoted tourism, as an example, because they're, they're, to be fair, and I hope no one from Sterling is listening now that I said they were earlier, you know, there's very few people that are going on the map, ooh, we need to go visit Sterling. Like that's, that's probably, they're probably coming to visit family and friends or they're passing by. But we can do things to attract people. We can do things to promote. And an, an, an example is we're right off Highway 4, Canamex Corridor, major north-south corridor from Canada to the U.S. Well, we've made a point of, in, you know, through a grant program, we got the EV charging stations. Because if you're coming into town to get snacks or coming into town, maybe to take a, a dip in the pool to cool off on your commute, we want you to be able to charge your EV. And we know that's a trend. You know, if, if the government legislation holds that you can't buy an internal combustion engine by 2035, we want to be prepared for that and future proof as well. So how do we make it easy for you to come to our community uh, as well as have something for you to do? But that, that is a challenge for many small communities. Where do you do, what do you do in the community? After a long day of meetings, after a long day of uh, working, where do you go into the community and just decompress? Let it all go, knowing that tomorrow when you're out, you may be asked many questions about and do that educational communication part that we've talked so much about in the last 45 minutes. Where do you go in the community to just let it all unwind? Yeah, I think part of the attraction for Sterling is we have uh, oversized lots. Many of the properties are half, to have to a full acre in size you know many many people in sterling still have horses in their backyard and again uh, we allow that if you've got enough space so for me my backyard is my oasis i have my own little park I, I i have neighbors i know they're there if i need them but i can't see them i can't necessarily interact with them if i don't want to so for me it's that backyard oasis and that you know i have the benefit of urban amenities but a country lifestyle in an urban setting and so for me that's the real benefit of living in sterling when i have my granddaughters with me of course it's the outdoor pool in the summer that's where we camp most of the time uh, that is the key amenity in the community and you know again we come back to those trade-off decisions it's very expensive to operate no one in their right mind runs an outdoor pool for the limited season that's available but I'm very conscious of the fact that I would be a dead man if we ever chose to cut funding to that establishment. And it is the key attraction in the summer. So that's definitely where you can find me in the summer months. Uh, so to end the, the interview, I have one last question and it's the million dollar question. I think every municipal leader needs to be able to answer it, but I think they know how to, but it's always great to have it on record. And that is what makes the village of Sterling such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family. Yeah, for me, it's the fact that we have proximity to the large urban center of, you know, 100,000 people in Lethbridge. We're only 20 minutes away. So whether it's career, whether it's post-secondary, you have access to all of those amenities, but you can escape to this oasis that's that's in this rural setting that you, you can live a country lifestyle. We still very much individual privacy and individuality. You know, there's no there's very few housing controls on what you build and how you use your property that, you know, we firmly believe that you should be able to sort of king is your castle is your kingdom and, you know, you, you design accordingly. Right. So I think that laid back country lifestyle, but with the benefit of all of those amenities. And secondly, we're very family focused. And that also sounds cliche, but our K to 12 school was recently modernized. We have about 370 students. So, it's almost like a private school. The teachers know their students by name. Many of them, you know, many of our students are there for their entire curriculum until they move on to post-secondary. So for families to have the ability to come to a community, you know, you literally, you know what your kids are doing before they do because the community looks out and yeah, the, that's the advantage of a small town. Uh, everybody knows what's going on. You know, that, I think that's why people come out is we, you know, our tagline is this is a community where families thrive because you've got a safe environment, you've got a supportive environment, and you've got all these amenities to have, to raise your kids. And so I think that's a key draw. 
how often in the summer do you know where the kids are because all the bikes are in the front yard of someone's house? <laughs> exactly. Well, my kid, my kids, when they were younger, used to joke that I knew what they were doing before they did. And so, you know, it was always their biggest frustration. Like, how did you know we were getting up to no good? I'm like, because I've had two phone calls. Uh, so, you know, that's that's the advantage, right? Um, Trevor, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been a pleasure to sit down with you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down and talk about yourself and talk about the village of Sterling. It's always a pleasure to talk with municipal leaders across Canada, and you are no exception to that. So thank you so much. Oh, I appreciate the opportunity and a platform to spread my propaganda about our beautiful community. So thank you for that. Thank you for joining us for another great episode of the Cross-Border Interviews. Your continued interest in delving deep into the issues that shape our communities across Canada is both inspiring and essential. Now, as we wrap up, it is my hope that you've gained valuable insights into the intricate world of municipal politics from our guest today. Now, if you found this dialogue as engaging as I did, don't forget to hit that subscribe button today. By subscribing, you're not just staying up to date with the latest conversations, but you're also playing a vital role in supporting our endeavor to bring you more meaningful content like you saw today. Now, we couldn't embark on this journey without your support. Creating content that sheds light onto the issues affecting municipalities requires dedication and resources. Now, if you believe in our mission and want to help continue us to grow, please consider visiting our support page conveniently linked in the show notes below or by visiting crossborderinterviews.ca. Every contribution, big or small, goes a long way in ensuring that we can keep delivering the kind of content you've come to expect from us. Now, once again, thank you for being part of the cross-border interviews community. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.